Hey Authority Hackers, welcome to this week's show episode. In this episode, we are going to do our now usual monthly roundup. And there's some very interesting topics that we're going to be talking about. First, we're going to be talking about the Google indexing issues and the fact that they removed the recrawl feature inside the Webmasters console and how that affects on-page SEO work. I've also tested the new Cloudflare APO site speed optimization on some of our sites and I'm going to be showing you my results. There's also Amazon that sent that weird email to associates and asked them to really disclose their affiliate links. We're going to be breaking that down and what you need to do for your sites. And also our favorite tool for SOP management and all that kind of like internal tutorials for the company just went free. So we're going to be sharing it with you as well as a bunch of other news. So I'm not gonna tease you more, let's get started. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Atari Hacker Podcast. So today is going to be a bit of a news roundup, a lot of tech actually. We're going to talk a lot about tools, but before that, we're going to be talking to Mark and ask him how's it going. So how's it going, Mark? Well, funny you should ask that. Last week, uh, I showed you the Asana socks which I, the oh, pink God. Asana socks, which I, I had on my feet. And I thought today I'd just like take a little trip down memory lane to, I think it was two or three years ago, just before Christmas at my parents' house, which was in a different country at the time. Um, there was a, a package arrived for me with uh, uh, some socks in it. So let me show you those. Is this, uh, I think I know what this is. Side ground? Oh, yeah. That's, that's, I, I that's upside package. down, but. SiteGround actually sent me some socks as well. So guys, if you have any socks out there for your, your brand and you want featured on the Authority Hacker I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like some people charge thousands of dollars for, for sponsoring on the podcast. For us, it just costs a pair of socks, yeah. you know? Um, so, so it's probably some of the cheapest, uh, the cheapest uh, sponsor you can do. But yeah, it's like, I guess you can send socks to Mark. Uh, if you're on the site, put put some funny ones. If you're sending socks to Mark, like like I I want socks that say like how's it going, Mark on the socks or something <laughs> like this. Please, uh, l be a little bit original. Uh, but fair enough. Let, let's see. We're talking about a lot of tools actually today, so uh, maybe some of them will actually check this out. Um, let's actually jump into the news roundup. Um, but actually, the first news is going to be a news that concerns us. So sorry for the self promo, but it is the last time the last piece of content that's probably coming out about this because the Atari Hacker Pro. Uh, membership and enrollment is closing tonight. You can have all the information on AtariHacker.com slash pro. Basically, this is our most advanced training and community. More than 400 videos, more than 5,000 customers and a lot of updates that we have announced throughout this week. You can check it out, out on AtariHacker.com slash pro. So please don't miss the deadline because it's the last time we let people in this year. Uh, and honestly, it's going to be a while in 2021 before we let people in. So. Uh, please don't miss that out because we always get emails and we don't do these kind of like fake deadline extensions, etc. So it's closing, it's closing tonight uh, at the end of the countdown unless something crazy happens. So go and check it out if you haven't checked it out yet. I'm just going to close that parenthesis because I imagine a lot of people who listen have seen the ads, have seen all of that, have seen the emails. Um, so we're going to be closing it here. Unless you want to have a last word on Atari Hacker before we join, jump on this. Now nah, let's talk about some other stuff. All right. Uh, do you want to do the? Should I do this one? Sure. All right. So basically, I talk a lot about that feature. Google has removed the request the request crawl feature. Sorry, uh, on the Google Webmasters console. Uh, I usually use this to do essentially A/B testing of my on page. It is a box that you could. I mean, you could essentially put your URL in Webmasters console and then press that button, and Google will quickly usually reindex that page and usually update the rankings for that page based on the changes you've done fairly quickly as well, depending on the authority of the site. Some of our sites took five minutes. Some of our sites, it took like maybe one or two days, but it was still fairly quick for low authority sites. And I've, you know, in a lot of tutorials, et cetera, I've used that function to demonstrate how I could quickly essentially test on page changes, maybe revert back if my rank rankings went down, et cetera. And unfortunately, Google has had a lot of crawling issues lately and just indexing issues as well. Uh, we've experienced that. If you've seen my video on like, um, like uh, re-updating content, et cetera, we put a card up there. Um, I actually used that feature in there and actually it took four days for Google to re-index the page, which kind of messed up with the video in there, um, but eventually it did work. Um, and so, they say it's going to come back. 
uh, some people think it's maybe never coming back. They said, you know, Google, they're historically kind of like pretty bad at telling you what's going to happen for these kind of features. And one of my memories on this is they're not provided in, in Google Analytics. So if you have done SEO for a while, we used to have all the keyword data for everything in Google Analytics. We would see like which keyword people Googled and which page they landed on and if they converted as well, which was really the power of this because you could see on the query level, your conversion in analytics, and you could actually decide which keyword you wanted to optimize for SEO. And then Google rolled out SSL, so HTTPS on google.com, and that essentially stopped that data to be provided to uh, Google Analytics, which is kind of bullshit because they have all the data internally. Um, and but also in anyway. ads, AdWords, so. Exactly, it still works in AdWords, et cetera. So it's kind of bullshit. But initially when they released that, they essentially said it's going to be a single digit of queries that will be affected, meaning less than 10%. Um, today, <laughs> go, go check your Google Analytics, 99 point something percent of your queries are going to be affected and a few queries will still pass some data, but it's too few to be useful at all unless maybe you get millions and millions and millions of visits. Maybe there's a little bit of data here, but it's pretty useless at this point. So. I'm wondering if they're not pulling the same trick here and we're never going to see that button again and there's going to be a webmaster's console update and that button will just be gone instead of being grayed out like it is right now. Or maybe um, they'll overall just maybe they'll do yeah. what they do at the the street lights for the crossings in I think New York where they have the the feature they have the button you press it but nothing happens it just does it automatically in its own yeah. own basis. It makes you, I think there's, uh, it makes you wait more. Like if you press the button, you're more likely to wait than trying no, to No, they're, they're all light light synced things. to um, the, like the, the light. Yeah, so, so like you can, you can so, so um, yeah. cars can like drive for straight, like yeah. go, go through quite a few crosswalks at the, the same time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so like I, I'm wondering what's going to happen. A lot of SEOs on Twitter did vote that actually would not come back. So I, I hope it comes back. It was really nice. It was, it was a way to essentially make SEO much faster in terms of feedback. You could change and boom, get, get CDO results really fast. And that was really nice for on-page SEO. And that's one of the things that for me pushed my focus on on-page SEO a lot more because I could get that these quick wins. You know, if I spent a day just doing that on-page stuff and re-indexing, uh, th there was a limitation after four or five pages, they would essentially like kind of like put you on the snooze and uh, tell you see you tomorrow and not really re-index your pages too fast, but at least for the first few pages, I was able to really get some work done and really imp improve the traffic on sites really fast. I hope it comes back. Let's see what do, happens. Do you think there's another one where they're they're trying to make it harder for people to know what's going on and run these tests and, and do that? Maybe. So they're like, well, we'll have to go buy ads and stuff. It was a bit too good, you know? It's like, it's, it's kind of one of these things where if you have that function and you kind of like start making proper scientific tests on things and do that over... You know, let's say you take a thousand days and you make five tests per day because, or maybe you have multiple sites you can test on or whatever. You can start really having a good idea of what Google is doing with like tiny changes because you would get your feedback in rankings really fast. So, uh, yeah, part of me is thinking that, but to be honest, they could just have put some more delay on it without removing it. You know, they, even if they put two hours, it's, like, it's still enough for you to jump on something else and not really go back to this. Or it would just make it a lot harder. Whereas like high authority sites is almost instant and that's what made you stay on that task and kind of keep optimizing. So they wouldn't have to kill it to do that, but I could see them deciding to do that. Yes, let's see. Uh, next story. Next one we're talking about is hunter.io, which is a really good tool for finding email addresses, uh, which is very useful in, in link building. So at the start of this month, they actually announced, well, they didn't actually announce, they, they just, without warning, changed their their pricing so that before you would, let's say spend, uh, I think it was 99 euros for a month and you would get, what was it? 5,000 credits. And you could use that for finding emails, for verifications, for whatever you wanted. But now they've split that allocation. So you get 2,500 search credits and 2,500 verification credits and you have to use them. You can't use one group for yeah, yeah. the other kind of thing. Um, it was really weird how it, it, it just appeared on the page and no one knew what was going on. There's no announcement, nothing on their site. So uh, a bunch of people contacted them and, and it's actually not too bad for existing users. It's actually slightly beneficial in a way because for existing users, they've doubled the allocation for each, each category of points. 
So you can still do everything that you want to do before, but let's say you're, you weren't using Hunter for verifications. Um, you now have extra verification credit, so you, you, you can use it um, for that. If you haven't signed up to Hunter, then it just got a lot more expensive, double in fact, um, if you're not doing verifications on there. And there's you know, an argument to be said that verifications are much cheaper to run than, than email finding. So is this like a stealth price increase? Well, possibly, it yeah. Is, for sure. <laughs> they, I, I reached out to Hunter and asked him about this and they actually came back with what's a, a reasonable, I don't know what you call it, excuse, but reasonable um, explanation. And they were saying that a lot of people were signing up and they're a bit miffed that they had to pay, use a credit to find an email and then use another credit to verify that. So it felt like they were basically being double charged for a piece of work. Mm. And so that led to a lot of customer confusion, which is something you and I know a lot about. Uh, and th that led to a lot of confusion and people were just not so happy and they want to try and explain that away a bit more. Um, so smart mm -hmm. move in the sense that they've solved that problem and managed to kind of raise their price for some people at the, at the same time. Um, but they were at least generous in that they were, they, they kind of grandfathered people in it. Um, at, at previous prices, uh, previous credit allocations. So, yeah, that's that, that's what's been going on there. Would you still recommend it as the tool for beginners? Like, I guess a lot of people, if like they don't have an account now, they're like, oh, should I use this, or should I try something else? Is there something that makes more sense financially? Et cetera, so you know? it's been. I did an experiment a few years ago where I, I tried all these services and looked at them, and Hunter was by far the best back then. Now, have been a few more services come onto the market in the past year or two. Um, so I feel like maybe it's time to run another set of experiments on this yeah. to, to see what else is out there. Um, they were good for a while, but like if this is the direction it's going, then maybe it's, it is time to look at alternatives. But I, I would stress that the last time we looked at alternatives, that the quality of results you were getting from like Snovio and, and, and the others was, was significantly worse than, than what Hunter provided. Um, so we'll see. Yeah, one thing I want to add as well is that actually Hunter provides a free outreach tool as well. So you could argue that maybe they're increasing the price of the email finding service, but you get a free outreach tool that you would normally pay for yeah. if you went with the competition. So and it's, like it's, argue it's that, legitimately yeah. good. Like it will do 90% yeah. of what Mailshake does. We mentioned this in the podcast a few months ago. Um, like it's very, very good. And you don't actually even need a premium account to use it. You can, you can use it with one email account with like the free account. It's obviously a way to get, get people into their ecosystem and, and that, but you know, fair enough. Uh, and given the, pr the price yeah. of Mailshake these days, you know, the off the amount you'll offset by saving will cover the extra credits to which you need perhaps. That's so, what I wanted to say. Basically, if you look at the old when Hunter did not have an outreach tool versus and paying for, let's say, Mailshake plus paying for Hunter, uh, essentially you get the same thing for the same price. Now you get the outreach tool plus the number of credits for the same as you would have from like paying Mailshake plus paying Hunter that didn't have an outreach tool at the time. So uh, it's bad, but it's not it's not terrible. It's just like it's not as good as it was just for at least a few months where you had the outreach tool and it was cheaper, basically. Um, anything else on this story? No. Nope. All right, so let's jump on the next one. It's actually, I tested it. I tested the new Cloudflare site speed service. They call it automatic platform optimization for WordPress. Uh, it costs $5 per month, so it's quite interesting. And, and you know, so for me, it's kind of like in price point, it's comparable to something like WP Rocket, for example. Uh, WP Rocket is a WordPress plugin. I think you can pay $45 per year, I think, to uh, use it on one site or something. So it's, it's close enough. Uh, in price to be comparable. And I tested it on two sites actually. And actually it's running on Autority Hacker right now. Uh, it's running on Autority Hacker. And I tested it on another site that I'm going, I'm not going to disclose. And I'm going to show you some screenshots. Actually, I put some screenshots for the guys who did the podcast. Um, but what happened is when I put it on that other site, it went from serving uh, maybe like 60% of, of files-ish, uh, depending on the days, etc., from Cloudflare. And then the rest was essentially served from the origin server, which is you know, your hosting server um, to 99.5%-ish of sites being served by Cloudflare. And essentially, Cloudflare served the entire site at this point and your uh, origin site, uh, origin hosting is just here to, you know, establish the site, then Cloudflare caches it and serves pretty much everything apart from a few things 
uh, in here. I've also done uh, a page speed test on it. Now the page speed test I'm going to show is not going to show you the GT matrix score. I'm just going to show you a time to first bit. And it's like, it was quite good, like 187. So when we use services like NitroPack, uh, our time to first bit is actually quite a bit worse. It's like, it's usually around 400, 500 milliseconds. It's 187 here. And then the content full paint, which is the one I'm looking at uh, on that screenshot is 1.3 seconds. On the side that's fairly simple, but it's still running Elementor, it's still running like uh, Astra, I think, uh, et cetera. So it's like pretty good overall, like I'm pretty happy about the site speed. I'm not showing you the full score because actually that site is running at Thrive. And so the score is not looking very beautiful and like it's not very, very fast in the end because all these ads load at the end and uh, there's a lot of scripts that ads drives load and that's how it's monetized. And so like that's why, but I think this score that you're seeing here is pretty good and you can compare it to yours if you want. Uh, I have found it to be like uh, the site in the end was not as fast as Nitro Pack on Notorious Hacker. The site is a bit slower. Um, it doesn't do image optimization as well. It can it can re, like it can resize re optimize your your images. You can do WebP, but it cannot resize it for the size of the browser. So I coupled it with a uh, short pixel actually, and they're running an AppSumo I think this week or next week. Uh, so you can go and get it and pay one time and and use that, and do, they'll do all your image optimization. Uh, but overall, I'm pretty impressed. $5 per month uh, for something that, in my opinion, looks better than something like, let's say, uh, having your site on SiteGround and using uh, WP Rocket because then you get on like really fast servers, etc. Like it, it's essentially better. Um, so I'm pretty happy about that. And I think coupled with something like ShortPixel is going to be our mid-tier uh, page speed optimization. You know, like I don't want to spend 40 bucks per month on Nitro Pack because, you know, it's like this site is still growing or it's like a smaller site, but I still want a pretty punchy site that goes pretty fast. Even if it's on chat hosting or something, we're going to be using that. We're going to be using the $5 automatic platform optimization on Cloudflare together with ShotPixel. And it's really good. I would recommend that people check it out. Uh, yeah, no, you can't try it for free. I was thinking about it. You can try it for free if you're business only, which uh, it's already 20 bucks a month, but five bucks, yeah, good value. Overall, I like it. And a lot of members who tried it said it was pretty good as well. So check it out if you want to check it out. All right. So the next one is the Amazon Associates disclosure warning, reminder, email. I'm not, not quite sure how to phrase this, but uh, earlier this month, Amazon sent out uh, an email to all of their associates, their affiliates, uh, and they were reminding affiliates that it's their, their duty uh, and that they're required to do two things, make their affiliate links clear and conspicuous. And they went into some detail to explain what that means. Uh, so by clear, it means that, I'll, I'll read it out exactly what they said. A clear disclosure should be as simple as, and then in quotation marks, paid link in brackets, hashtag ad or hashtag commissions earned. Uh, now, initially, there was some thought that maybe this was meant for social media influencers to use those um, those tags, basically. Uh, but someone contacted Amazon and actually they said that this is meant for all links. And I know when you contact Amazon, you get a different answer every time you, you, you ask someone some different there. So again, take this with a pinch of salt. But uh, this, I know for a fact that this is actually the law, uh, nothing to do with Amazon, but the FTC sets, sets rules for this. And by law, you're supposed to disclose every single time you have an affiliate link on your, on your site. So imagine if you've got, you know, a table with 10 links and all the images are links and then you got another table oh, further down. You're actually supposed to say this is an affiliate link next to every single link on your page. That's even if you have a disclosure, even if you have affiliate disclosure. Can you make so, a tool tip? What, sir? Do you think if you put a tooltip, like let's say you mouse over on the link and it says this is an affiliate link when you no, mouse over? No, because it would does. That, would that count? Well, first of all, uh, and this is nothing to do with Amazon. Let's talk about the FTC here. Uh, you can't actually say that it's an affiliate link because the FTC thinks that most people will understand what that means. So you have to say that you get paid or you're compensated or it's sponsored in some way because it thinks people will understand that. Uh, mousing over, not okay because... Um, I guess some browsers might not use it or on mobile, you know, I guess. On mobile you're not going to have it anyway. Uh, so it, yeah. it's really dumb. Like I, I, I don't know a single website that complies with this law, like even the big ones, uh, not a single one. Uh, and I don't know anyone that's been, um, you know, what went through enforcement for, for something like this in, in the U S either. Um, so 
and so that's the, the clear thing. And the conspicuous uh, part of it was Amazon were saying it should be placed that, that, that this disclaimer should be placed near any associate link or product review in a location that customers will notice easily and they shouldn't have to hunt for it. So that's an indication that you can't just stick this down at the bottom and say, hey, that was an affiliate link. It has to be next to it. I spoke to a lawyer about this four years ago and he said that it actually has to be before the affiliate link. So when people are, are reading it, they're, they're, they're not, don't discover it, click it and then later see that it was, uh, it was sponsored or whatever. Um, so understandably, a lot of people kind of freaked out a bit. And like, I think a lot of people thought that they were getting personally emailed by Amazon. Um, there's a big thread in our Facebook group. People were, were saying like, should we do this? Should we not? And my view with something like this, where the enforcement is non-existent and nobody else is complying is like, stand back, wait and see how it, how it develops, how it plays out and then take action. If you're more risk averse, then maybe you want to get ahead of the curve, but I, I think it would be such an affront to your user experience um, to, to have, you know, hashtag ad or paid link next to every single link on your, yeah, your website I that. that, yeah, I just, I don't see, it's just not realistic, um, to, to do Isn't that. there a saying that says like, uh, if you run after, if you're run after by a lion, you don't need to be faster than the lion. You just need to be faster than the guy, than the slowest guy or something like this. Yeah. And it's kind of like. Yeah, it's, so kind, it's of kind of like, like the way you, of looking you, at it, you, you know. It's like if everyone moves as a herd, like just kind of keep up with the herd, and you'll you'll be all right. But that's the thing, you know. For certain websites, the impact, like the chance of getting uh, penalized or whatever, kicked out of Amazon so Associates, low, yeah. is low. Even if you break the rules, the, the the chance is low. But the impact of being kicked out for some websites is very significant. That that means it does make sense to to err on the side of of caution there. Um, actually kind of brings me on to my, my next point, which was, um, around, uh, the YouTube channel Linus tech tips. So they posted mm -hmm. a really interesting, it's like a, if anyone doesn't follow, it's a tech hardware, uh, review it, yeah. information, uh, YouTube channel, really, really good, very well produced. They've been going 10 plus years now. And they did a video recently, uh, breaking down the their income. So they had a, a pie chart and they, sh they compared the 2016 to the 2020. And in 2016, they were making 16% of their income from Amazon Associates links uh, from the YouTube channel. And then in 2020, that's down to 9%. And they went as far as to kind of call out Amazon in a way. Uh, and Linus said, and I quote, we're actually afraid of calling out the links of, of calling out the links in our video for fear we're getting kicked out of the program again. An affiliate program with rules that are so opaque and enforcement so random that the participants are afraid to promote it. Um, so pretty kind of uh, strong words there. And I'm sure he's he's probably just the most vocal, like high profile person to, to make such, a, a, deal, such yeah. a statement. Um, but it, it shows you that it's not just, you know, small, medium affiliate sites that are are, are feeling the, the difficulties here. It's like, it's big publishers as well. Um, but all this is to say that I don't actually think Amazon cares about this. I don't think that Amazon wants you to do this. Um, I don't, I don't think they're, they're really bothered. All I think they're doing is they're showing to the FTC that they're pretending to try and enforce or being the good corporate citizen and reminding people of the law that they're supposed to comply by, even though nobody does. So, they can't be accused of saying, oh, well, you didn't tell anyone or whatever. They say, hey, no, look, we sent these emails, you know, it's in our terms, you know, everyone agreed to it, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it's just, I hate when the, the law and like the enforcement and what everyone does is is not the same. It just makes it, there's a big gray area and it's like just kind of uncomfortable and you have to manage all this risk and stuff. But uh, I would say, don't worry about it too much for now. See see how this develops. Yeah, I mean, they're also being investigated for like monopoly and things like that. So it's like overall, like any point they can get with governments, etc., showing that they're trying, they will take and it's an easy one for them to take. And, and again, they will not enforce that. There's no way they will enforce that unless they actually want to close their affiliate program because pretty much everyone is not complying with the rules. But the fact that Linus called it is a big deal. I mean, that video I was checking has over 1.5 million views already. 
Um, and yeah, he's a really big profile affiliate. If you don't know this guy, he's really he's pretty much one of the biggest YouTubers out there, 12 million subscribers, uh, which is pretty big for someone that reviews commercial products. And there's a, they have so, a bunch of other channels as well. That's not the only one. Yeah. They have, it's a huge media company, actually. It's, like, it's a cool media company to study for if you want to do videos. Like what, his tone in videos is, is actually um, the number one inspiration for how we do videos when we do proper videos, not podcasts, but rather videos. Like this is the tone that, in my opinion, is the best on YouTube. So if you want inspiration, check him out, actually. Uh, next, we're going to talk about more tools. As I said in the intro, pretty much all my points are tools, actually. It's kind of funny. Uh, we're going to talk about Slab. So Slab.com, not many people know it. Actually, uh, I'm going to quote her again. Bibi actually asked about, <laughs> Bibi the link builder asked about, uh, 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 you know, a place to put your wiki, SOPs, tutorials for staff, etc. cetera. And, um, and I posted Slab because we've been using it for maybe, like, it's not a year yet, but we're Come getting slowly year, there. Yeah. Yeah, um, it's been a while, but like I, I remember I found it on Quora, actually. I was reading about wiki systems, etc. I was looking at Notion at the time as well, was also. I was looking at all these. Um, but I really liked Slab because it's like, it's basically a CMS, right? It's kind of like building a website, internal website for your company, but it's really easy to use. It's just like you can do H1s, H2s. You can embed a Google Doc in it. You can embed a YouTube video. Um, and the content looks really nice and it's nice to use it. You navigate like a website without being too much maintenance to maintain and you still have the comment system you can uh, ask questions you can do all of that and we we've paid for that right so since the beginning we've paid um like i think we uh, they changed our pricing but i think we were paying four or five dollars per month per user um but they actually released a free plan that pretty much has everything we use and it's up to 10 people and uh it's really good like it's like the fact that it's free now I feel like we should definitely recommend this because um, we've been using that for a while. And it's been, it's like, we've tried many times to build these kind of things, even in Google Docs, etc. And it's like, it works, but it's not very nice. And yeah, uh, navigating the, Google Docs, you know, you get that loading time, etc. The key to building a system with all your SOPs that actually gets used is just to make it as beautiful and nice and usable as yeah. possible. That's like, Slab really doesn't do anything that you can't do with a series of Google Docs and maybe like an index a spreadsheet with an index of them all. So you, you can do all that. It's just, it's not very nice. It's not very usable and people don't seem to like using it as, as much, but something like Slab, yeah, it's just, it has that almost like Apple sense of, uh, yeah, it just yes. feels nice, you know? It feels nice to use, so you use it and people use it. And like, you know, like we had that team call yesterday. It's like, you know, we were like a uh, staff just like, oh, I just added that new page on Slab. I did it. Nobody asked them to do that, etc. Because it's nice to use. I don't think if we were using Google Doc, yeah. uh, it would have been done. So it's like, uh, I would recommend it because it's free. So you can go on slab.com and check it out. It's hopefully free forever, but you can host all your stuff in there and we love it. And we think you will love it too. Uh, you can go on. That's basically all I have to say about Slab. Next one is Ahrefs. They've introduced uh, historical ranking data into their their tool. So you can now compare how a site is ranking um, historically over time. So you can say, like, how has that changed from three years ago till today? Uh, I believe the amount of time you can see in the past is dependent on which plan you have. Um, yes. And this goes back, if you have the top plan, not the enterprise one, but the agency, I think it was a 399, uh, you can go back five years. Um, and then the others uh, are, I think, three years. And then the, the light ones, maybe a year, even less than that. Um, I think it's six months, yeah. Yeah. But it's a, you know, it's a cool feature. Um, you, can, you can see uh, ranking data, um, I think traffic as well. Does it show that historically? Yep. Um, and I mean, traffic according to Ahrefs, right? It's the uh, traffic yeah. metric of Ahrefs, not the actual traffic. It's quite important, actually, because it's a big distinction. It's not always the truth. Sure, and, and, and far from it. So, you know, if you want to see how your competitors' positions have changed over time, maybe you're looking to model after um, their pages, which have, have been improving over time rather than um, getting worse over time. And maybe you think, oh, well, these these ones are like more in favor with Google or they're doing more of the right things what Google wants to see, then it can kind of inform you in, in, in that way. So it's a nice extra extra feature. doesn't cost anything. It's probably quite easy for them to build, but yeah, it's kind of You cool. know why I like it as well? It allows you to like 
kind of like look at SEO as a long-term trend versus like how are my rankings doing today, which is kind of like, uh, again, it's kind of like looking at the stock market every day. It goes like this, but then you just don't look at it and you look like a year later and like you do, you do a lot better overall, etc. And it's like, it's quite nice in that aspect. And um, it kind of like helps me feel that everything's going better than it may feel on the bad week or something like that, going to check that report. So if you need emotional support with your SEO campaigns, it's actually a pretty good feature to look at because usually even if you're having a bad two months, three months, you check like compared to a year, compared to two years ago, et cetera, you tend to do a lot better. And yeah, so I, I like that feature for that reason. And it helps you get a bit of a, a distance from your campaigns, basically. Um, actually, another tool, another tool news. So really, uh, I think it literally that's all I have. Um, but I'm going to talk about a new WordPress theme I bought. And I didn't buy a WordPress theme in three years. Um, but like I, I've been hinting at it several times in the past few weeks, but we are seeding, starting a bunch of new sites lately. And so, you know, it uh, encourages me to try these Cloudflare services, maybe consider which WordPress theme we're using, etc. And I bought the Cadence theme premium. So um, they have a free version of the theme, which is really good. I tried it as well. Uh, it is... Um, it's part of uh, one of the new recommendations in DAS, actually, like of the themes people can use. Um, I like it because, for example, like you know, um, you know how in WordPress you could never make the header you wanted. Let's say you wanted to put a button in your menu bar. It's pretty much impossible unless you, unless you write code on most themes, right? It's like, but this has an actual. It feels almost like a page builder. You can literally just drag a, a button item in the menu and then just write whatever you want and do all of that. It has you know, phone numbers and things like that, etc. So you can essentially build something. And it's something that it's like it almost made me want to ditch page builders on uh, like at least for the first version of a website, you know, it's like it, it's the first time in a while that I feel like, OK, I can do pretty much everything I want for a very basic site, like a basic blog or something without having to install an Elemento if I don't want to. And then, you know, at the point when you get to like building sales pages, building opt-in pages, et cetera, I would probably still bring Elemental. I still like it and it's more customizable, but they have a global color system, for example. So you can set colors and like all the elements you put in are going to be picking these colors. So you stay in brand. You can pretty much put elements anywhere you want on your site. It's very, very fast. They have uh, mega menus as well. Um, yeah, overall, I quite like it. I think GeneratePress is still taking the palm if you want like the most minimalist WordPress theme with like not many functions, but that is the most efficient possible. But this is like, in my opinion, the best balance between features and and speed. And uh, I would recommend people check out at least the free version. I got the premium version and uh, I'm probably going to be using it on uh, a few sites actually. So I wanted to let people know and if they can try it for free, it's even better, you know? Great. Uh, so the next uh, piece of news is actually about the news, uh, or rather about Google and what it's doing with news. Uh, so in Australia, um, there's been a, a campaign recently by Google and YouTube, um, basically a scaremongering campaign. They're saying that um, the Australian government is going to make laws, which mean that um, Australians won't be able to get free access to the news and you know censorship and bad for YouTube creators and, and all that. And none of that is actually true. Uh, it's actually uh, the Australian government coming in and saying that Google can't just, you basically take other people's content, put it on Google News and make money from it. They have to work, Google and Facebook and, and all that, they have to work out a compensation model so that uh, when a story is appearing on Google News and Google's making money from it, um, the publisher actually gets a percentage of that that revenue. Um, so the news is actually that more that, that Google's gone from a position of saying this is going to be terrible to actually like starting to agree to it. And that the debate now is more about the actual amount uh, and the percentages that who's getting what. Uh, so it's interesting because it, uh, this is the first time globally that anything like this has happened. And it could be very, very good, good news, no pun intended for uh, uh, news outlets because they've been really struggling for to make money recently, especially you know with, with physical newspapers not being sold at really that much at all um, in 2020 at least. Um, so yeah, it'd be interesting to see. I, I'd be very surprised if more countries didn't um, enact similar laws. And to be honest, it's about time. Um, I think uh, I think Google's maybe 
abused its power as a monopoly a little bit too much in this this area to the detriment of of everyone because it's creating all these false like poor incentives to create sensationalist clickbaity news rather than like actual hard cold hard facts and stuff so i'm yeah, hoping no, this no is facts a bit in of, the headlines so people click yeah i'm hoping this is a reversal of of that trend but yeah interesting development and it kind of touches on some other areas there's, there's potential overlap here with what Google does with featured snippets, for example. I mean, could we see uh, Google paying publishers a percentage of its AdSense revenue when uh, you know they land on a, a pay? But a do you think they would do that? Snippets? They would take the argument. They send you free traffic anyway, so they'd be like, okay, we'll pay you for that for that content. Well, this is this is this is the traffic, same you know? argument that they they say. This is the same yeah. argument they used in this case. They said, well, actually, we send a lot of traffic to these these places, um, so you know, it's fair. Yeah, uh, but it. the Australian government was like, no, it's not. Uh, and it looks like they're going to come up with a, an agreement now. So, All right, let's see what happens. Uh, that'd be hilarious if you start receiving checks from Google for ranking. Yeah. Um, like like new new business model or something. Yeah. Um, I mean, anyway, honestly, honestly uh, ever, the, ever since we watched the, the um, anti antitrust hearings earlier this year, mm -hmm. it's really like, I just see all the time, Google is such a monopoly. Uh, and honestly, like s shit needs to change with that. Uh, like I'm getting more and more in favor of like uh, of of a breakup. This um, is this is not an activist channel, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, like see. speaking speaking about um, consolidation and um, breakup and all that. Um, there's another story which came out recently um, around Dot Dash, was a media company acquiring uh, two really big websites, Serious Eats and Simply Recipes, and uh, it Please just it was another part of a kind of ongoing set of news that where big publishers and, and um, media companies are kind of consolidating and acquiring more and more sites and then kind of building a bit of a fortress around themselves in this this area you know um, we, we've seen red ventures do that with the in finance with the credit card space um, and really interesting actually because I went on red ventures site recently just to, to research uh, before this podcast and I couldn't find a list of the sites they own anymore. So they they seem to have like taken them away. Um, I'm not sure if they're trying mm. to like hide the fact that they're this big behemoth now or, or Do they what? have something in the footer maybe? You could just search for the footprint in the footer or something. Oh yeah, I mean, you, there'll be a way to reverse engineer. I think, you know, trademarks, uh, Red Ventures, LLC and yeah. those kinds of things. Privacy policies, stuff like that. They, they, there's legal stuff they need to actually put in there. Yeah, but they, I mean, they used to have a kind of portfolio, like here's all the sites we, we, we own, but. They used to brag and now not anymore, basically. And it's like, yeah. it's kind of scary. It just means that they like don't want people to know. It probably means they have a lot, I guess. Um, yeah. So it's it got me thinking, you know, um, and I want to ask your thoughts on this. Is consolidation inevitable in this space? And if so, is that a force for good, bad? Does it help consumers? Does it help publishers? Uh, does it hurt publishers? What do you think? Uh, I mean, I think it depends a lot on Google, to be honest, because it, it in the end, it's like if Google changes the rules, let's say like, let's imagine, you know, like you can in schema, you can put like your company information, etc. So they can essentially get that data from the site and uh, for example, if you want your review snippets to show up, you actually need that data in your schema. Otherwise, they don't show the star reviews, etc. In, in a search rating. So, I mean, if Google does nothing about it, yeah, I think it's going to happen. It always happened in every industry. It's kind of the Wild West at the beginning. And slowly but surely, you know, people like uh, winners emerge, buy out competitors, etc. Or like bring them out of business. And eventually there's more and more big stuff. It doesn't mean there's no um, there's no small companies as well. I mean... If you look at like um, giant supermarkets and stuff like that, for example, it's kind of the same thing where it's like before there was all these small shops and eventually there was these these giant kind of like commercial zones that were developed with all the shops and you can find everything. And it ate away a lot of, um, you know, food traffic from the small shops in the city, etc. And a lot of them struggle, but it doesn't mean they don't exist anymore. Uh, and specialty shops especially are doing still fine provided they have some kind of unique value you can find in the chain stores, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm kind of looking at it that way. Actually, I think the the, the, the commercial zone example is probably uh, not a bad one. Well, it doesn't mean that everyone's going to disappear, et cetera. But it means that if you are the kind of people who generate, who just like very generic content the same way as these big brands do, 
then the question is like, aren't you just gonna start competing against bigger and bigger people? And isn't it time to essentially bring some originality, some unique features like these specialty shops do to your businesses so that you can compete in terms of differentiation rather than in terms of just trying to outsmart them on which keywords you pick, et cetera, because I think eventually they they figure them out all out, even if they take some time, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, I do like the idea of bringing, I mean, you can even see like the way we're running Atari Hacker, like the fact that we get on camera, we put our personalities out there, we do all these things, et cetera. That, that kind of brings that kind of like specialization thing that maybe bigger outlets can do, et cetera. And like Moz would never talk like us or even Ahrefs or like bigger companies, et cetera. And what it does is it builds an audience that would maybe not necessarily find what they find in our content in maybe bigger companies' content. So um, yeah, I, I, I think consolidation is going to make things more difficult. It doesn't mean you can't survive. Small Smaller people will still be around, but yeah, it, it's, it's a maturing industry basically. Um, what do you think? Um, I think it's potentially bad for consumers and bad for um, search engines, publishers. Think, actually, I don't know if search engines really care so much. Well, um, if it's the same editorial team behind the same the same ten credit card sites, like isn't that just killing diversity? Into it, it is, but like, you know? do they again? Do they care? Um, does Does Google care? Um, yeah, if, I, I think it's bad for consumers because you with affiliates sites, especially because you'll end up with a situation where, you know, Red Ventures or someone negotiates a deal with uh, American Express and they're just like, all right, we're going to push so them, yeah. push them number one on everything. And then it's going to like change what people really believe is the best card or, you know, I'm just using yep. that as a hypothetical example. I'm not saying they actually do that, but. You know, it's possible to do that when you own all 10 results on a SERP. Uh, so it makes me think of uh, TV, actually. So, it's, you know, in TV now, it's like everything is commercialized. Everything, the business model is definitely figured out at this point. Um, but what that does is the trust of people in the medium is decreasing rapidly because essentially everything is up for grabs for sale and for business. Um, and so like people like, you know, even recommendations in talk shows, et cetera, like people literally get paid for these placements and so on. And so there's, there's almost no free speech left on there. And so as a result, people essentially have some defiance against the, the media. And, uh, and I'm wondering if the same thing could happen with Google, et cetera. But that's when Google might react and actually like bring back the diversity or like use the company level tax to bring, to bring different companies on page one, et cetera. So we can't tell what's going to happen. What we can tell is obviously there is a lot of consolidation happening, but you know what that means also, it's not all bad for people listening because consolidation means big paydays for a lot of people out there that get bowed out by these people as well and can have like nice ex and on a personal level do really well, you know? Um, so I, you know, it's not all doom and gloom, etc. but I think differentiating is the way to last a long time the same way specialty shops do. Um, like if there is, if you go to a tailor or something that does something special, has some specialty, etc., you will not find that when you go to Walmart, you know, and it's like, and that's kind of the point. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, it's, it, it is happening in every maturing industry. I don't see why we would escape from it completely. All right, so that's basically it for this show, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, just a quick reminder, we are closing Authority Hacker Pro tonight. You can go on authorityhacker.com slash pro. You get all the information. I believe you have seen the information by now with all the emails, the ads, etc. But this is the last time we let people in this year, and it's going to be a while in 20 and 21 that, uh, until we let people in again. So just make sure you don't miss it out if you want to access that content sometime soon. On this, uh, if you enjoyed this podcast, don't forget to like it to subscribe and click on the notification bell. It really helps us. And we'll see you next week for another episode. Bye. Uh, to give you an idea, when we run on services like, um, fuck, what's the name? Uh, what's the name of the one we use all the time? Edit this, by the way. Uh, what's the name, Mark? Can't oh, remember. Nitro pack? The set, yeah, Nitro pack, fuck. It's like big blank. That's the... Uh, so for example... <laughs> that's the, the That's the end. For one, for one new, I get it, you know? So when we use services like Nitropack, uh, I'll talk to you.